Y'all, I am new to Creative Mornings, but I'm a sucker for manifestos, and I love to hug and high-five, so we can do plenty of that afterwards, and I'm like sort of tempted to do one of those weird things where you like run down the aisle and high-five everybody, but I'll, I'll refrain myself. Um, so I love a few things more than um, getting to share about the things that I'm passionate about and the people that I love. So today was a really exciting moment for me, and um, I'm excited to connect with everybody here to talk about what I think is the 21st century weapon of mass construction. Um, and before we get to what that might be, although you probably have some ideas, I want to go back in time a little bit. Um, when I was a little kid, I was like really, really motivated to change the world. Is there anybody like that in this audience? A few, a few. I'm sure it's like everybody, though. You don't be shy. Um, so the year was 1987. I was six years old. Um, I lived in South Africa with my family. It was during apartheid. I knew that something was wrong, but I didn't know what it was called or, you know, the politics behind it. But I knew that there was something different. and. Um, like many of us, I had a mom who read me stories when I went to bed at night. And so one night my mom was reading me the story, and in the story there were these kids that um, were living in a homeless shelter. And I remember being like profoundly curious and impacted about these kids. And so one night I asked my mom, like, is this, is this real or this is just like a sad made up story? <laughs> And my mom was like, no, 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 this is, this is real, like, this happens. And, um, and I went to bed that night, and I woke up in the morning, and I was like, I am gonna, I'm going to fix this. I have a home. I'm going to make sure other people have a home, too. And I didn't quite know how, but I, like, set off on this mission, and I collected my pennies and stored them in a piggy bank, like many of us did. Um, and, you know, maybe I got, like, 20 cents a week, 25 cents a week, but I was, I was finding coins on the ground. My piggy bank was filling up fast, all until the day that I had 10 rand. Now, that is not 10 grand. That essentially is like the South African version of a dollar, which is even less than $10. But I had this $10, and I went to my mom, and I said, I, like, I'm ready. Let's do this. My mom was like, oh, okay. So... She drives me to Cape Town, the big city nearby, and um, I had the, this like pink ruffled dress on. This is me, six-year-old Heidi, gonna save the world. And my 10 Rand, and I was in it to win it, y'all. So we get to the shelter, I meet these kids, and it was just this moment of like, I get you, like I am you. You are me, we're totally different, our circumstances are different, but like, it's all gonna be okay, because here I am with my 10 Rand. Um, so we leave that day, I'm feeling like pretty solid about my role in the world, who, what my life is like about, right? And then weeks go by, and um, I get this letter in the mail, and my mom's opening the letter, she's like, it's from the shelter. And I'm like so ready to hear how like, we did it, Everything's done. Everything's better. There's no more shelter. And, um, and this picture falls out of it. And before I can even hear the words of the letter, I see this picture. This is like the actual picture from when I'm six. And I was really confused. I said to my mom, I was like, what are, what are they doing? My mom goes, oh, they're making cupcakes. And I was like, what? Cupcakes? I, I like set out to make sure everybody had a home. What's happening with the cupcakes? And she was like, yeah, that's like what the 10 Rand bought is cupcakes. <laughs> there was like 
this moment of despair and defeat. Um, and like, what happened? I went, I went to do something good, right? Now, along with that despair, I also think there was a moment where I got the power of story to connect you to something bigger than yourself. Um, so, flash forward to today. I um, now am a co-owner of a business. My other two business partners are these like fierce women, fiery, amazing, and we have um, a firm. And we do marketing and advocacy for issue-driven films. And we work predominantly with filmmakers and with distributors who have movies that are A, like super compelling, so it's great content, and B, have the capacity to create empathy and to connect with people and sort of move them to take action in ways that could be meaningful and impact change. Um, and my colleagues and I all have one thing in common. Some of us have a few more things in common, but fundamentally, we all believe that films can change the world. And when we show up every day, we do work that makes sure that they do. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about me and who I am and what I do and why this work is important to me. So I want to connect you with a few people and some powerful stories that I've been able to, um, to hear and connect with along the way in the work that I do. So this is the, these are the first folks. This is Che. Che is a award-winning hip-hop artist. His rapper name is Rhymefest. I call him Che. Um, he won a Grammy for writing the song Jesus Walks with Kanye. And he also recently won an Oscar for co-writing Glory, the song at the end of the movie Selma with John Legend and uh, Common. Che's from Southside Chicago. And he's been estranged from his father for 25 years since he was a teenager. And a cool thing about Che, which is like gonna out how uncool I am, is, you know, I, I'm working with him, so we'll go to events together, and he's always like, what's up? This is Fest. He doesn't even call himself Rhyme Fest, like Fest. And then he'll roll in like, SI and T1, and everybody's always in sunglasses. And I'm like, hey guys. I'm Heidi. Like, very awkward. Um, Jesus walks. I love that song. Like, I really do love that song. Um, so, even better than Che is uh, Brian. And Brian has been homeless for 25 years. So, what happened was Che ended up buying his father's house in the south side of Chicago and sort of through that journey, or buying the house that his father grew up in. Sorry, that didn't make any sense. The father's homeless, but Che bought the house that his dad grew up in. And I think through that process, kind of felt this yearning to reconnect with his father. And so he went looking for him, and he didn't have to look too far. Turns out his dad was living homeless um, and had, you know, an addiction to alcohol just a few blocks away. And so in my father's house tells the reconnection of that story. Um, and it's it's pretty powerful. It also hits theaters on October 9th in Washington, D.C. and 19 other markets. Small plug. Um, <laughs> buy tickets now. This is, this is Trina. Trina is a woman I connected with a few years ago. And um, Trina is a veteran. She served in the U.S. Navy as a seaman. And she's from central Kentucky. Trina was also drugged and raped by military police on her base in Alaska and pretty much left for dead. And um, through our work in the Invisible War, Trina and a number of other subjects in the film, all the subjects in the film, had this profound courage and ability to like rawly share their story or authentically share their story such that other people could connect to this issue, which was an epidemic of military sexual assault, in a way that just wasn't possible through white papers or facts and figures alone. And um, with Trina's help, she like really became part of our impact campaign. So through like marketing and issue advocacy, we you know use communications tools and tactics to develop these grassroots campaigns around issues um, or around films that drive change on social issues. 
Trina like, would be our email signer. So we would send emails not from the campaign, but we'd send them from Trina. And she helped us raise $30,000 to support other um, su survivors and victims of military sexual trauma. She also started a petition for us which generated over 100,000 signatures. And that sounds like, whatever, petitions. We hear about those every day. But what was amazing about this is that we generated enough signatures to bring Trina to Capitol Hill. And she delivered her, her petition signature. She did a media tour. And that later that afternoon, um, her petition was calling for the passage of one piece of legislation that was pretty controversial and something that we were definitely in support of. But it needed more. Republican support. And later that afternoon, she got a personal phone call from Senator Murkowski, who is from Alaska. And the senator said to her, I'm, I'm so, so sorry. I heard your story. I can't believe that happened. I'm going to co-sponsor this piece of legislation because like, never again is that going to happen in my state. And this is something that people have been working on for decades. And it just didn't get that sort of attention without um, stories like Trina's. This is Miles. Miles like makes my heart sing every time I look at him. So is anybody familiar with Bat Kid or SF Bat Kid? That's Miles. Um, he has this really cool Bat Kid pose. And we actually started a campaign and then all of these kids started doing Bat Kid poses and posted them to social media and we did this big Tumblr. It was like the cutest thing ever. Um, so Miles is from Tule Lake, California, population 993. He was diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia before the time that he was two years old. Um, and his wish was granted to become Batman for a day by the Make-A-Wish Foundation. And I got to work not directly with Miles. I want to be honest, I haven't met him yet. But I got to work. Um, with the people who shared his story with the world when we're working with Warner Brothers this summer and a film came out about him. And what's really unique about this is um, the Make-A-Wish Foundation, through Miles' story, increased their volunteerism by 40% and saw a huge increase in donations over time as well. So the reason I wanted to introduce these people is because you can see by my standing in front of you and looking at all of these pictures that there's no, like I have nothing in common with any of these folks. I'd like to be a rapper, but I'm not. Um, <laughs> next time. <laughs> um, I've never served in the US military, although I'm a huge supporter of the US military. And while I have faced, you know, a health scare in my life, I've never had a life-threatening disease like Miles has. But I spend all of my time, and not all of it, but like definitely 90% of it, and most of my energy working to share the stories of these individuals so that we can create greater change and we can shine a light on, on people like Miles and Trina and Che and Brian, um, ultimately so that we can cause empathy in others, so that other people can experience the same empathy that I've had when I hear their story or I connect with them, and really ultimately so I can fulfill that six-year-old letdown of wanting to change the world. Um, here's this great quote that I read by the president a while ago. I just want to read it right now. It says, there's a lot of talk in this country about the federal deficit. But I think we should talk more about our empathy deficit, the ability to put ourselves in someone else's shoes, to see the world through those who are different from us, the child who's hungry, the laid off steel worker, the immigrant woman cleaning your dorm room. Um, I just think that's so true. So it brings me to back to this idea of the 21st century of mass construction. Um, ah, yes. Why film, right? Like, couldn't it be policy? Couldn't it be legislation? Why film? A few reasons. Um, one, narrative transportation. This is a real thing. I did not make up the word. And I don't think I shared this with y'all, but I, you know, I'm from South Africa, but have lived the longest period of time in California. 
So there's this like real hippy dippy almond milk drinking, let's have a kumbaya circle part of me that is not frequently expressed in Washington, D.C. by others. By me it is, but not by others. Um, and so narrative transportation could very easily be like my hippy dippy lingo. It's not. It's like a chemical reaction. It happens in your brain when you hear somebody else's story. You are transported into their world and what it could be like to be in their world in a way that other things just don't do. Um, why film number two? Mass distribution. So I'm not only talking about, you know, a blockbuster movie or a feature film documentary. This could be a two minute video. This could be a 30 minute TV show. Um, technology has given us incredible access and film is transported to the masses pretty easily and pretty cheaply this day and age. Um, so that's the second reason why film. Number three, it's, it's the gateway drug. Um, it is the gateway to, to broader social change. And it's sort of like, does anybody have dogs? All right, all right. My colleague Charlie and I over here, we have um, a made up dog, a make believe dog in our office. It's pretty great. You guys should come visit. You would like our dog. But I say all this to say, um, you know, it's like when you have to give your dog medicine and the dog doesn't want to take the medicine, duh. So you wrap it up in a piece of turkey or meat or whatever. That's what movies is. It's this gateway to broader social change. Um, so let's go back to the six-year-old. Because I thought that was kind of a powerful story, right? I tried. So number one. Did I have a powerful story? I thought so. The book was really powerful to me. Number two, was empathy present? Was there narrative transportation? Most certainly, I felt impacted. I was like ready to go. Um, <laughs> number three, did I have a concise intended outcome? Well, I certainly had an intention, change the world. But it wasn't concise, it wasn't measurable. Anybody who's all about the SMART goals, it would like not pass the SMART goals test. And um, I didn't really have a call to action, right? My call to action was for myself that I was gonna collect my pennies, but it wasn't a call to action that was aligned with my like very vague intended outcome. Like it certainly wasn't gonna bridge that gap. Um, and was there a film? No. And the reason I bring that up is, A, I'm a slow reader, so I'm just more inclined to watch films than I am to read books. But that aside, um, you know, we all recommend good books to our friends. And I think in this city, maybe more than others, we like read a lot. But it's easier for somebody to consume content that's 15 minutes long on video or an hour and a half long than it is for them to be like, yes, great, I'm going to read that 500 page book. Thank you so much. But you can do this in a day or two, and, and it creates empathy in others quicker. So it's not you alone having that experience and wanting to share and change the world. It's other people getting in on it with you, too. Um, <laughs> the reason those things are important is because you know they always say that good intentions pave the pathway to hell. In my case, they paved the pathway to uh, cupcakes, which was like equally as devastating in the moment. <laughs> Sad cupcake. Um, so I want, a few, I want to share a few, like a process that has worked really well in the work I do to be able to take a film, have it create empathy in others, translate that empathy into action, and create a lasting social or political change. There's a pretty basic process that we use. It's not rocket science. Um, and then I want to share a few principles that have personally worked for me. Take what works, leave what doesn't. But uh, I invite you to try them all on. And to help me share this process and these principles, I want to introduce you to somebody else and share one more story. Um, last year, well, before I say last year, I should say this. I'm involved in um, a national security think tank here in Washington. And I kid you not, you guys, sidebar, 
I was like the creative in my household growing up. I went to performing arts high school. I like liked the song and dance. My sister was the lawyer, so it almost lived like she's the smart one, I'm like the creative one. And <laughs> so I came to Washington five years ago, again, wanting to make change. And my sister was like, good luck. <laughs> There's like no ocean there. There's no funny people. Although I'm going to show her a picture of this. Um, <laughs> And so I got involved in this national security tank as a partner or a fellow. And my mom one day was like, wait, what? <laughs> Did you pay somebody to let you in there? <laughs> I was like, no, they asked me. Um, anyway, I always think that's amusing. So national security think tank does this media diplomacy. They selected me to go to the Middle East, to go to Turkey on this media diplomacy last summer, June 2014. Um, and in June 2014, there was no like mass media coverage of ISIS. In July 2014, there was, but in June 2014, there was not. And I had never been to the Middle East before. And the Middle East and Syria and the Syrian war and all of these things sort of lived for me like, I don't know, I don't, like, I don't really get it. I don't not understand the history. That's for smart people. I'm gonna like focus on women's rights or the military sexual assault or homelessness or all these other things like somebody else has gotta solve Syria. Um, how many people, by the way, are there in the room that work on Syria or like are deeply care about making a difference in Syria? Awesome, thank you for your work. Um, great, so uh, did anybody look around, by the way, when I asked that question? There were like, two hands. Um, that is how I felt last year when I went too. Like, yeah, I care, but. So I met this woman, Ola. This is her right here in the blue. We match. And um, Ola like really changed my life that day. And I'm going to share a video with you that I took of, her, of my colleagues and I like asking questions, interviewing the woman next to her. Um, it's not a good video. I'm not a professional cinematographer. I am not a content creator. I make the things after the movie is made. So bear with me. Uh, but this is Ola working with us. Yeah. Yeah, we went to Quebec. But how? But yeah. how? Just for the violence to yeah, stop? For the violence to yeah. stop. Yeah. And it's sad to be stop, gone. Okay, if there's air pan, okay, this is uh, one important point. Yeah. Most of the Syrians will go back, not all of them, okay? Because some of them uh, until now feel horror inside them. Uh, even if the situation stopped, okay? The bad situation stopped, okay? They can come they back. Yeah. Because you, they, they you don't should trust, wait, trust, I think. Yeah, like you want to know that it's yeah, over. For, for me, yeah. I should wait until the situation become better. Uh, what happened? Yeah. What made this family decide to leave? What happened? Yeah. yeah. This family or what family? This family. Yeah, okay. In They decide to go back again as to Syria when there's stop of bombing. Bombing stops. Yeah, mm -hmm. violence and like that. Of course, yeah. Are there, do they still have family in Syria? What? Do, do they, they have family still in Syria? Yeah. There are there are lots of families inside Syria. Right, is theirs. Yeah. in the country. Yeah, 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 in the Yeah, in the country. Yeah, in Yeah, 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 in the uh, her relatives wants to come here, but uh, there's no uh, opportunities for jobs. So they still right. inside Syria. Um, how many people in the room want to make sure that this woman has a meal tonight? Yeah, totally. So. I was so shaken up by this experience and I had really, you know, I've seen poverty, have been a lot of places in the world, but had never experienced such futility. I mean, Ola, 
I'm pretty sure comes from a family with means. Um, but we were meeting with refugees that couldn't even fit in the refugee camp. There's not enough space. And they're living in run-down cement buildings and tents and they have no running water, have no electricity, walk 10 minutes up the hill to find a neighbor or a person who lives there to ask them for water. And I've been doing this for two years now. And what's interesting watching this now is that I remember that day feeling so hopeless for them or like experiencing their loss of hope. And who wouldn't, right? They have the clothes that they walked with on their back from Aleppo 50 or 60 miles away overnight one night to try to escape the bombing in the countryside. But there was this sense of like, oh, like when the bombing stops, we're going to go back to Syria. And so watching it even today, it's really interesting because like it's not stopping, right? It's getting worse. We're seeing more and more people fleeing. But a year ago, people weren't covering this in the media. And I had this feeling when I was there, I was like, wait a minute, this does not add up. I, I live in Washington, D.C. If anybody's working on this, it's people in this, in this room um, or in this city. I work in media. Like, if anybody, I watch films and movies and media and videos all day long. If anybody was going to see a video of somebody like this, it would be me. And I don't know anything about the problem. I'm like so disconnected. It took me being here on the ground face to face. We were on the Syrian border. I was like, I don't know, hundreds of feet from the border. And so I was pissed. I wanted to do something. And all I had was this stupid video. So we got back and we decided, okay, we can't, like, I don't know how to change the Syrian war or how to end it, but I know that it's going to take $4,000 to feed the 3,000 people in that village for one day. And so we put this video up on like rally.org. My colleagues and I, there were about five of us, um, we like pounded the pavement and got people to give us $25 at a time. And we ended up raising nearly $20,000, which, you know, isn't enough, doesn't feed them every day, but it's, it's like a few days more than, than it was before. Um, so a couple of things about process. Number one, step one, find an empathy multiplier. So when I had that experience in Turkey, I was in Turkey, by the way. I don't think I ever said that. I, um, I knew that I was experiencing crazy empathy, but I was like, how do I tell my friends? How do I tell the people around me? How do I tell my friend who runs the Syria portfolio at the Pentagon that this is what it's like on the ground, right? So I used that video, and it, it worked to a large extent. Um, number two, define the intended outcome. I decided in that moment I don't know how to change the war or end it, but I do know I can like help increase aid and help increase awareness. Number three, grass tops targets and outreach. There's also this moment like going back to that insecure part of me like I'm a creative, not the policymaker. There's this moment where I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know, but if I can find the person who has the answer, I'm going to tell everybody, and then we're going to fix it. <laughs> so I met with people at the White House, I met with people at the Pentagon, I was like, we got to do something. And what did I come to find? Like, oh, right, duh, nobody has the answer. There isn't that smart person sitting next to you that has the answer. The reason it's not, like the reason the problem exists is because there's, nobody has an answer. Um, but the grass tops, targets, those key decision makers who I did connect with were also profoundly impacted by the story and like created certain things that I can't really talk about here, but stuff happened. Um, call to action. Figure out a concise way to tell people what to do. And tell people one thing. I see this all the time, specifically with all of my clients who I like, really, really love, but they'll be like, and then also tell people to do this. And then remember, tell people to do that. And then let's tell them these 10 other things in the one email. And it's like, no, Holmes, nobody does 10 things. People do one thing. Find the one thing you want the person to do, one. Um, grassroots activation, then get a bunch of people to do that one thing, because together it'll make a greater impact. Um, OK, so a couple of principles. Principle number one, as much as it pains me to say this because I am one of those like in it to win it type of people. Principle number one, it's better to light one candle than curse the darkness. 
There's this other really beautiful movie coming out later this year called Racing Extinction. It's about the next mass extinction. You know, climate change, the animals are going extinct. We're going down, but we can turn it around. Um, <laughs> my big takeaway in the movie was like, just do the one thing. Pick what that one thing is, but don't hate that it's wrong. Because there are things happening, but like, have your stake in the matter. And if all those kids got that day were cupcakes, who gives a shit? That is, that's more than they had the day before. Like for them, right, for us, we have muffins when we show up at the talk on a Friday morning because we're lucky and we're privileged. For them, they don't have cupcakes every day. Like get the cupcake in front of somebody. Do the one thing. Um, number two, this is my favorite favorite. Shit's messy. So many, and I think especially in this town, I don't know if this is true for all of you in the room. It's certainly true for me. As a creative person, my brain is like in 50 different places all the time. And I used to curse it. I used to be like, oh, if I could just be more linear, if I could just be more logical. No, like the reason that I can make change or bring new solutions to the table is because I have this nonlinear approach. And movements, movements happen. They are not clean and organized and together. Like we're organizers to, to push mover, movements forward, but we don't keep the movement organized. That shit is chaotic. Like spur <laughs> some more chaos with a clear call to action. <laughs> Um, principle number three, I did not forget to make my slide. Um, principle number three is my favorite. It's nothing. Bring nothing to the table. And I know I'm going to get flack from my friends who are going to be like, that was from California of you. But I am such <laughs> a true believer that in the space of nothing, you can create anything, right? Like on a blank canvas, you really like the sky's the limit. And I think especially in cities like this, we're so driven by like agendas and time. And I'm going to get to that one meeting. I'm going to get these five things out of that person. And then I'm going to go on my way. And I'm going to make my movement. And I'm going to organize my movement. And then I'm going to change the world. No, like <laughs> just bring nothing. Be present. And together something will come true that you couldn't even th have thought of by yourself. Um, and principle number four is... Be bold. I think there are so many people in this room who are those change makers. I think everybody in this room is one of those change makers. And when you're somebody who wants to make change or change the world, you bring things into existence where they don't exist already. And, you know, there's that saying about penguins, how, like, everybody thinks, oh, the first penguin to jump off the rock is, like, the one that sets all the other penguins off the rock too. Have people heard this? Yeah. That is false. That is a lie. It is the second penguin. Do you know that that first penguin is like in the cold water alone? Like, hey guys, here, here I am. Nobody, no, it is that second one that actually causes the rest of the people to go. But the people in this room are penguin number one. Be penguin number one. Do things in the face of no agreement. So um, everybody has their name tag on, right? Will you look at the person next to you and tell them what your creative weapon is? One minute? Yeah. Did you do your creative, you did your creative weapon? Who wants to share with me what their creative weapon is? Oh yes, you! Awesome. I like it. I like it. You made something out of nothing. Um, so bring papaya to everything you do today. <laughs> and the moral of the story here is... Like, film is the 21st century weapon of mass construction. This is, like, one of the best things we have at our disposal. But whatever your creative weapon is, whatever that thing is that you do best, that you bring into the world, use it because 
Like, the world needs you right now, and there is a moment for you to use that to your fullest and make the greatest impact possible and cause empathy in other people. And I, um, I challenge you and encourage you to use it with gusto. That's it.